hit. Hit. Well done. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Hey, Dad. OK, tell me you missed us. I'm afraid to say I got a hit. You didn't? Yeah, see, look, look there. Hit. 700 metres. Good gracious. Yeah, well I, I did miss the first time. You have got the most modern guided missile there well, probably in the world. No, I know. Because one thing worth saying is that the Sagas were wire-guided missiles. You had to keep the sight on the target all the time the missile was travelling towards it. It had to be fixed there, whereas you just fired it and forgot. Yes? Yeah, it's hard enough to get the, the sight locked onto you uh, and actually have to, to have to keep it there for the entire time the missile's in the air. It would be incredible. You're, you're shaking, you're breathing, you're nervous. I, 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 wouldn't, I couldn't have done it if, I, if it hadn't been a lock-on and then forget about it. Very, very powerful form of anti-tank warfare. For the Israelis, quite a new ordeal. In 1973, the Saga was turning the Sinai into a tank graveyard. The tanks, which were the pride of Israel's army, were being destroyed by Egyptian infantrymen. Israel had begun the war with around 300 tanks in Sinai. By the end of the first 36 hours, they'd lost approximately half of this number. Things were critical for the Israeli soldiers in Sinai. But that was only half the story. At the same time the Egyptians launched their attack, the Syrians had launched their bid to retake the Golan Heights. fertile soil of this battlefront couldn't have been in greater contrast to the arid desert of the Sinai. The Golan Heights had been a valuable prize when the Israelis captured them in 1967. These Golan Heights provided Israel with more than just good farmland. They afforded security too. This is the Golan here, once part of Syria, occupied by Israel since 1967. The area is no more than 15 miles wide, and it ends with a steep slope down to the River Jordan. To Israelis, the Golan was a vital buffer between their heartland and Syria. Despite this, only 170 Israeli tanks and 400 soldiers were stationed in the front line on the Golan. Most of the Israeli forces were here in the north, because Israeli commanders felt this was the most likely place for any Syrian assault. But when the Syrians made their move, their 1,200 tanks and 60,000 men attacked all the way along the line. Six hours into the battle, the Syrians' overwhelming strength was beginning to tell, and their tanks broke through down here in the more lightly defended south. By nightfall, they'd almost reached the western edge of the heights, where they could look down on the River Jordan. If Syrian tanks could now seize the vital bridges across the Jordan, they'd be able to pour across the river into Israel's heartland. For Israeli soldiers in bunkers along the front line of the Golan Heights, the first day of the war had been a disaster. Their strong defensive positions had done little to halt the Syrian advance. This is one of the Israeli bunkers dug in to the Golan Heights, and it's got an incredibly strong construction. It's deep underground, it's reinforced concrete, and these steel plates here as well. The amazing thing about 1973 is these strong points were so difficult for the Syrians to take, they didn't even bother trying. They simply bypassed them with their tanks and kept pushing forward. By the end of the day, the Syrians had taken almost the entire southern half of the Golan Heights. It was a nightmare situation for Israel. It had been caught unawares with far too few troops on both front lines. All Elazar, the Israeli chief of staff, could do 
was to mobilize every single reservist in the country. In towns, villages and farms across Israel, news filtered out that their country was under attack. Because it was a holiday, TV and radio was off the air, and so soldiers on motorbikes had to race through built-up areas, calling up the reservists. I was in my kibbutz on Yom Kippur when I uh, heard the planes taking off from the Air Force base in the area. I drove with another member of my kibbutz, who was also a company commander, to our assembly point. On the way, we said that whatever was happening, we'll probably be back home in a day or two. Men and tanks headed out towards both fronts, but it would take two long days before they'd be ready to mount a counterattack. Then, on October the 8th, David Elazar announced to the world that his army had finally gone on the attack. This morning, we started our counterattack, and we shall break and destroy completely all the attacking forces. Elazar's first push was in the Sinai Desert. The Egyptians had known that the Israelis would always counterattack, and they'd been lying in wait for just this moment. As soon as the Israeli tanks came into view, they let rip with devastating rocket, artillery, and Saga missile fire. Israelis suffered heavy casualties all day. At least 50 of their tanks were destroyed or disabled. To the Israelis, it was abundantly clear this was no longer the poorly trained Egyptian army they'd fought in the past. By the end of the day, Israel was facing catastrophe. Israelis had believed that once their army was in place, they would be victorious. Now they had to face the shocking truth that this hadn't happened. Prime Minister Meir sent an urgent request to the Americans, begging them to resupply the country. Under attack on two fronts, Israelis felt their country was about to be squeezed out of existence. It would need a bold change of strategy to save the day. The simple truth was that Israel did not have the strength to fight this war on two fronts at the same time. Elazar had to concentrate his strength on one front before he tried to roll back his enemy on the other. In the Sinai, the Egyptians were separated from Israel by hundreds of miles of desert. But here on the Golan, the Syrians were perilously close to Israel's main villages and towns across the Jordan, just a few miles drive away. The Golan had to be Elazar's priority. So he ordered the army and the air force to put everything they had into throwing the Syrians back. Some tank units would attack halfway along the Golan to relieve the pressure on Nafakh, the Israeli HQ on the heights. Other Israeli tanks had already been ordered to go up onto the southern Golan, where the Syrians were closest to Israel's heartland. Their commander had been told bluntly, you are Israel's last hope. But one thing in their favor was that the Syrians had made an extraordinary decision to halt up on the high ground rather than press on towards the River Jordan. It gave the Israelis vital breathing room to cross the river and move up towards the Golan. On the night of October the 8th, Israeli tanks stormed the Syrian positions. The 
fighting raged around the clock. The Soviets had given the Syrians their latest infrared night fighting equipment. The Israelis had nothing of the kind. And that meant during the hours of darkness, the Syrians could identify the Israeli tanks and cause horrific casualties. I scanned the area with my scope and picked up a pair of infrared lights coming directly at me. I took another look. The headlamps were uh, still approaching. The Syrian was targeting in on us. Driver back up, I screamed. And the tank rocked back till we came to a stop. But as day broke, the Israeli ground troops got some much needed relief from their air force. Throughout the rest of the day, however, the Israelis fought desperately to hold the line. The Israelis knew that if they gave way here, their country faced a real threat of extinction. Losses mounted on both sides, but as the battle progressed, it became clear that despite some Syrian technological advantages, the Israeli tanks had thicker armor, and the Israeli crews could fire more quickly and more accurately than their Syrian counterparts. After four days of combat, I wasn't particularly worried by the Syrian tanks. It was enough to locate them and to have them come out to meet us, and victory would be ours. By the 10th of October, four days into the war, there was an astonishing turnaround. The Syrians were in full flight from here on the Golan. Israel's tanks chased them into Syria itself. And soon, the Israelis were within shelling distance of the Syrian capital, Damascus, just 30 miles off that way. Syrian President Assad sent a message to President Sadat, urging the Egyptian leaders to do something to relieve the pressure on Syria. And now Sadat made a momentous decision. Down on the Suez Canal, Sadat ordered his men to thrust way beyond the strong defense line they had established on the east bank of the canal. Their objective, strategic passes through these mountains. But to get there, they'd have to leave the safety of their SAM missile umbrella way behind them. It was a high-risk strategy, and Shazli was appalled by the decision. But Sadat was immovable. What followed would be one of the biggest tank battles in history. Twenty-five miles east of the canal, Israeli tank commanders were well dug in on high ground in good defensive positions. Across the open desert, they could see the sand being kicked up by hundreds of advancing Egyptian tanks. The Egyptians were totally exposed to withering Israeli fire. But over the following hours, the Egyptian tank brigades repeatedly tried to push further east into the Sinai. As the Egyptians moved out beyond the protective cover of their SAMs, Israeli aircraft rained down bombs on the exposed Egyptian tanks. The Israelis' skillful use of their tank guns meant that they pulverized the Egyptians exposed down on the open ground. The Israelis knocked out an estimated 260 Egyptian tanks. They lost only 20 of their own. Yeah, we fought hard. It was uh, a successful tackle. And uh, what made it possible was the fighting spirit of our soldiers. This battle was a turning point.